From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, SpacedOutRadio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, do a little shopping at the SOR vault. Pick up a book at We Read the Night. Join the Space Travelers Club for five bucks a month and Captain Shirk's SOR News wire is up to date daily tonight's show is brought to you by chive charities help make the world 10 percent happier by donating to chive charities today you can find them on our website what happens to people when they just vanish disappear without a trace for the last decade or so david politis a former police officer of 20 years has been studying these strange cases it started with people going missing in national parks But the more David and his team looked into these mysteries, they noticed a trend. Roadblock after roadblock in trying to locate information, sometimes even through freedom of information requests. Then the trends started becoming familiar. Clusters of people throughout the decades disappearing from the same locations. It's a mystery and a mission that David's group, CanAmMissing.com, wants to solve. For the first hour, we're going to talk about David's latest documentary, Missing 411, The Hunted. The next 90 minutes, it's about his latest book, on sale as of a week ago, called Missing 411 Canada. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Mr. David Politis, it has been a while since we've had the opportunity to speak and we've been trying for a long time to get you on this show, but you're finally here. Thank you so much for joining us on Spaced Out Radio for the first time. Hey, Dave. I'm humbled to be on your show, and I appreciate the invitation to be here. Well, I got to say, I almost threw out all the notes because I didn't realize you were this big of a hockey fan, and me being a former hockey reporter, I was just going to say, you know, screw it. Let's let's just talk hockey all night, but we can't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. Uh, I'm a huge hockey fan. I, uh, in San Jose, uh, I, I kind of raised two kids in that hockey world. I ended up coaching my daughter all the way to the championships in North America, and uh, nice. my son went on to play Division One for Miami, Ohio, as a defenseman. So, yeah, I, I'm a big, huge hockey fan. Very cool, very cool, and and you know what? It's a game that I have learned a lot from. I don't like a lot of the changes that have come through, but you know what? We got to evolve, and I guess I would consider myself now that dinosaur that used to still like fighting and things like that. But anyways, we're going to get into some major, major news tonight because not only do you have Missing 411, The Hunted, out, but you also have this great new book, And I want to commend you because a lot of investigators, David, they only focus on the United States. You are more well-rounded. You focus on the entire continent. And on behalf of all Canadians, thank you for for allowing us uh, to share our stories with you for Missing 411 Canada. You know, Canada's played a big role in my life. I've worked for a British Columbia company for three years. And um, I've traveled all over Canada and during my life. I, the country is gorgeous. The people are friendly. I, it, it's really like a second home to me. I love it there. Lots of Bigfoot. Lots of UFOs. Lots of ghosts here, too, man. You just got to go. Don't scare me before we get going here, Dave. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's start off with Missing 411, The Hunted. Why did you think this was an important documentary to do? Well, we did the first one, Missing 411, and we used one of your Canadian patriots, uh, Survivor Man Les Stroud, in that movie. And uh, Les read my books, and we were just about ready to go into production, and we had this conversation by the phone. He goes, hey, Dave, maybe I can help you on one of these cases. And uh, I said, you know, there's a case out of Washington where a little two-year-old boy disappeared in the middle of the woods, and uh, 12 hours later and nine miles later, he was found over two mountain ranges. And he goes, let me see if I can replicate his track in that amount of time. And we sent a crew out with less in the middle of the night covering a couple mountain ranges. And in the middle of it, at about 2 or 3 in the morning, he stopped everybody and said, hey, forget it. We're going to kill ourselves. I'll never be able to make it. 
This kid didn't do it on his own. I don't know how he did it. But it's a story of five different boys, young boys that disappeared in the wilderness, and it's their story. Some were found, some were never found. That was the first one. Second one was I wrote a book called Missing 411 Hunters, and uh, myself and Mike DeGrazier, who was the director on the second movie, kind of sat down went through the stories, and we said, you know, I think we could do something with hunters. And Dave, as you get stories into your show about the unusual, because of my books, I get probably 50 stories, 60 stories a month that are just bizarre. And I went through them, and I probably went through maybe four or 500 of these stories that people called in about what's happened to them when they were out in the woods. And we picked two that we could, we could scientific, scientifically validate that they happened. They aren't just allegations. Oh, you know, hey, it's a great story. This happened to me, but I can't prove it. No, these stories we can prove happened. And we kind of built the stories up through the movie, talked about different incidents, interviewed sheriffs, uh, search and rescue coordinators, families, and had them tell the story. And it's, I'm in it. I'm front and center in the second movie. But it's one thing to have me saying how strange it is, but it's a totally different thing when you hear from the sheriffs and the search and rescue people how odd these stories really are and how unusual it is that they can't find them. Well, let's start with Thomas Messick, because this was a gentleman who was a hunter the majority of his life. He was 82 years old in northern New York State. I mean, this is a gentleman who knew the ins and outs of hunting. He knew the safety. He had lost an eye due to a gunpowder accident. And all of a sudden, he goes hunting with his sons and and his friends and their sons and just vanishes without a trace. Yeah, Tom Messick taught hunter safety for 45 years. And uh, they owned a hunting lodge up in northern New York in the Adirondacks. And these buddies got together three or four times a year, went up to their big house up in the mountains, and they were like best, best buddies for for decades. And then in the off-season when there's no hunting, they'd go fishing together. And uh, the group was just an awesome, awesome group. And uh, one of them had, knew that there was some state land that was available to hunt behind his house. So they all got in a couple trucks, and they drove up to this lake, and it's about a three or four mile ride into the mountains on the Sturt Road. And you get to this giant pond, Lily Pond. And everyone gets out. And they have the, some of their sons with them. And Mr. Messick had his son there. And they said, okay, guys, all the old guys, why don't you line up about 50 to 100 yards apart. And uh, the boys are going to go up to the top of the mountain. We'll drive the deer down to you. And uh, all the old guys go walking down the trail. And they kind of line up. And. Mr. Messick goes into the woods about 100 yards away from his partner, and he sits down, and the boys coming down the mountain, they don't see any deer, but eventually, a couple hours later, they reach the group, and they all are are carrying walkie-talkies. So they get on the walkie-talkies, and they go, guys, come on, let's meet back at the truck. We don't see anything. Well, everybody returns to the truck except Mr. Messick. So they go back there, and they knew that he had... Uh, some wrapped candy and some other things, but he was fastidious. He would never just drop them in the woods, but they looked at the place where he was sitting. There was nothing dropped. There was no nothing there. They called his name. He had bad knees. He had one eye. His hearing wasn't good. His eyesight wasn't great, but it was okay in one eye. And uh, everyone knew he wasn't going to walk very far. So they started looking around. They don't, they don't see anything. They don't hear anything. He's not answering on his radio. Nothing's going on. And uh, after a couple hours, one of the guys goes, we better get natural resource rangers up here. So one of the trucks leaves. A couple hours later, the troops start arriving. Now, the weird part about the story, it's weird that he didn't show up. But when what you don't read in any of the reports is that when I was there, I got to interview one of the hunters that was closest to Tom. And uh, he was... It's like you're talking to your dad, one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. And I said, so after I interviewed him, I said, is there anything weird that happened out there? And he kind of cocks his head and looks at me, and he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, you know, near the end when we were sitting there, I heard something. And I go, well, what do you mean you heard something? I just heard something odd. 
And he goes, you know, hunting for 50 years, never heard anything like that. And after a couple of going back and forth, he says, it was like clanging together of two pieces of metal, like a trap closing almost. He goes, it was loud, and it was kind of up the hill towards where the boys were pushing the deer. So we put that in the movie, and I asked him, I said, did you tell the police that? He goes, yeah, but I don't, he goes, I don't think they cared. Well, eventually, I think half of New York's Department of Natural Resource people came up there, and they were searching, and locals were searching, and Mrs. Messick came up there, and the world was there. And a little side note that's really odd Amongst all of this, there's no evidence of a crime. They're not investigating a crime. They're investigating an 82-year-old man that's missing. But who arrives but two FBI agents? Now, a lot of people don't know, but the FBI doesn't investigate missing people. It's not part of their protocol. They do investigate missing children that are under three or four years old. That's a special subsection that they can investigate. But missing adults, they don't investigate. They get... They got world issues to deal with. They're, what are they doing showing up in the middle of the woods of New York on a missing old man case? And we asked the law enforcement people. We asked the head supervisor on the search and rescue. Nobody knew who called them. Nobody knew who, why they were there. But in prior books, I had written about older cases in the area of the Great Smoky Mountains where FBI agents were showing up on these missing person cases there. And when they were asked by law enforcement why they were there, they stated that they were just monitoring the case. And that's language for they're writing reports, they're sending them to Quantico, Virginia, to their profiling unit, and that profiling unit looks for other similar cases to match it against. And about four or five years ago, I said in the books, the FBI knows something odd is going on in the woods. And they don't know, but they're putting agents out there every time it's happening to write up the facts behind what occurred, and then they're sending it out to their profiling unit for an understanding and a comparison. So that was, that was very odd that the agents show up in the middle of nowhere. And uh, interviewed the, uh, their kids that all showed up to search, interviewed the search and rescue coordinator, uh, spent a lot of time in that area. And I asked the coordinator, search and rescue coordinator, who brought in his entire sheriff's department to search, I said, what kind of animals did you see in the woods? And he kind of looks at me and he goes, we didn't see any. I go, how odd is that? And he goes, that's really odd. He goes, I go, you didn't see squirrels, deer, nothing? He goes, no, nothing. Well, the boys, when they were pushing down the mountain, they didn't see any animals either. And when we were there, we didn't see any animals except the salamander. So for being in the middle of the New York woods, we should have been seeing animals, and we didn't see any. So uh, there were multiple, multiple searches over days, weeks, months. Uh, even a year later, people still came back hoping to bringing in cadaver dogs. They brought in scent trail dogs. Part of the profile points after looking at 7,000 cases that I write about in my books, I put down that one of the most common profile points you see in my cases is that when they bring canines to the scene, they don't pick up a scent. Sometimes the dogs walk in circles. Sometimes they just lay down. Other things, these happen near bodies of water or, or the victim is found near bodies of water. Many times if the victim's ever found they don't have a memory of how they got lost, where they got lost, or what happened to them. Another oddity is, if the person is found deceased, a large percentage of the time, the coroner can't figure out a cause of death, which is not normal at all. And plus, there's, there's times that uh, they're found in granite or boulder fields. Uh, many times, even though it might be a warm environment, they're missing shoes or they're missing clothing and they can't explain it, and if they're deceased, they never find the clothing. Those are some of the oddities. But months, months later, after Mr. Mr. Messick disappeared, they brought in cadaver dogs, and they could pick up a scent miles away. They never picked up a scent. So Mr. Messick, at 82 years old, walked out of a four- or five-mile perimeter, and nobody can figure out why, nobody can figure out where he went, and there's no scent trail. 
No garbage, no clothes, no blood, no walkie-talkies. His weapon was gone. And then 10 days later, a gentleman 40 miles away disappears named Fred Drum. Coincidence? Boy, that is, you know, I wrote about both cases. And the Drum case threw me. He, um, they had a rural farm, but not that rural. It was only maybe five or ten miles outside of a decent-sized city. Beautiful, beautiful farm with a river running behind his property. And uh, he went out on it one day, and he just didn't come back. And nobody can figure out where he went. And in fact, the, some of the searchers on the Messick case had to pull off and go to the drum case. Uh, I think in, in my books, I write about coincidences. I write about them all the time because it seems to happen to me continuously. I just kind of looked at this and I'm like, 40 miles away for any wild animal or creature is not a long distance. It may seem so if you're driving or something because you have to go there and you got to get to that destination. But for any wild animal, their predatory area, if that's what we could call it, 40 miles is nothing when you look at what the range that cougars have or black bears, grizzly bears. They're always on the move, Dave. So you bring up a good point. Let's talk about predation. That's one of the things that we do before I'll, I'll work a case or I'll write about a case is I'll vet it. What do I vet it against? Let's say the person has some type of mental illness, tells his family he's suicidal. I won't work that case. If the person was having money problems and it appeared like he maybe wanted to drop out of society and just disappear, I won't work the case. If there's any evidence of animal predation, I'll drop the case. And search and rescue coordinators are trained what to look for on predation cases. If somebody's attacked by a mountain lion or a grizzly bear, all you have to do is turn off your filter on Google and put up their grizzly bear attack or mountain lion attack and go look what a scene's like. And there's blood, there's torn clothing. People will scream. There's drag marks, drag marks where it's pulled, the body's pulled away. And these are just easily, easily found by tracking canines. It's not something that's going to be missed when search and rescue people are walking shoulder to shoulder through an area. We got about five minutes here before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. David Politis is our guest tonight. Missing 411. The hunted is the topic. You know, when you are looking at these cases, there's a lot of familiarity that seems to happen between all of them. And this is also the same for the Santa Fe cluster that you have looked at in New Mexico. We're going to get into the case of, of Audrey Kaplan shortly after the break. But what is with these clusters you have noticed? So when I was a policeman, and I worked a couple task forces, we'd let's say it was a robber that we're looking for, we'd put a big map up of the city in one part of the room, and we'd start plotting where the person hit. And just as a side note, the first place somebody hits that's a serial robber or rapist is usually a location closest to their home. And they'll start to move out from that location. And you can tell a lot after three or four robberies or rapes, you can tell a lot about the person. Well, as I'm going through these cases nine, ten years ago, and I'm starting to go through them, I'm thinking, you know, didn't I hear that that park before? And I said, you know, I I just need a big map of the U.S. I'm just going to start putting pins in it where these cases are at and see what happens. And oddly enough, there's a huge swath right down the middle of the United States, north and south, across the plains, where there's almost no cases at all. But there's 63 geographical clusters of missing people in North America. And the biggest cluster in the world, Yosemite National Park. And the number two cluster in the world is Vancouver. Really? Well, we are special around here. We are special. Does it have anything to do with the mountains, the water? Have you put anything like that together? So I've, I've always said that this is related to water. So you guys have the Fraser River that empties at least nine different lakes. Yes. And to me, that is strange because you have the ocean that feeds the Fraser that goes upstream to these eight, nine lakes that goes in between all of these mountains that gives you access to all these different points. And it's like the highway. If, if you were a 
person that could uh, be in a submarine, you could use that to go everywhere almost in southern British Columbia. And I'm not saying that that is it, but I've always said that water is somehow key to this. And it really plays out in Vancouver, Vancouver Island, uh, all the lakes the Fraser flows to. I mean, it's, it's right there. That's just amazing. Do you believe that the wilderness, the wild animals play a portion of this or a part of this, or do you believe that they're really irrelevant in these cases? So I've spent a lot of time in northern Montana, around Glacier National Park, fishing and uh, just hiking through the woods, and I'm real cognizant of grizzly bear. And I always carry a gun. I always carry a big gun. And I always make a lot of noise. And when you think about cougars, mountain lions, when I talk at conferences, one of the things I always ask the audience is how many fatal mountain lion attacks in North America in the last hundred years? Nobody gets it right. You know, the people say, oh, 100, 110, I hear 50. And the answer is 16. 16 fatal mountain lion attacks in a hundred years in the U S and Canada. And the reason I know that is because I wrote about a case regarding a young boy named Jared Adadero disappeared in Colorado. And the sheriff said that a mountain lion killed his boy. And Jared's case is part of that list, but it's number 17 and it shouldn't be there. Well, his dad took all the evidence, went to four different mountain lion experts and the mountain lion experts said, I don't know why the sheriff's saying that, because the mountain lion didn't kill your boy. And it was based on what they found at the scene, the clothing, no blood on the clothing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that go on, and I, I call it local report for local consumption. The police, the resource officers say something to appease the community. They have no idea if it's true or false, and they'll just rack it up to a bear, a mountain lion, whatever but nobody's really taking a a critical look at it. And I've got the experts now to look at these things and to come out with logical, ethical decisions on them. And we're finding a lot of things that are really unusual. Oh, man. I could just imagine what that would be like sitting in one of your meetings with your team trying to figure out these anomalous cases. David Politis is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio we're going to talk about the Santa Fe cluster and the cases around there coming up because we got a lot to jam into the next half hour of the show. His website, canammissing.com. If you want to check it on out, Missing 411 The Hunted continues right now on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, 
Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Welcome 
Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. We're going to get right to it. Don't forget, all of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We've got a plethora of features for you. You can sign up for the Space Travelers Club, five bucks a month. Do a little shopping at the SOR Vault or We Read the Night. And Captain Shirk has her Newswire updated daily. From Missing411.com, David Politis, we are talking about Missing411, The Hunted, right now. David, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Dave. All right. We're talking about these clusters right before the break, and one in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where a lady named Audrey Kaplan mysteriously disappeared And this is a strange one. I mean, when you go picking mushrooms, you just don't expect to find your way into certain tragedy. So, again, in the books I've written, I've I've written about subgroups. One of those subgroups is mushroom pickers. Another one is berry pickers. Well, Audrey was with her physician husband near the Santa Fe Fe Ski Resort, and they were on a, a fairly big trail. And they'd gone into this area. They had a summer house in Santa Fe, and they were going in there regularly to look for mushrooms. Well, Audrey wanted to go up the trail a little bit more. She was in her early 70s, but in phenomenal shape. And her husband lost sight of her. And it started to rain, and then it started to pour. Another profile point. There's a weather event in close proximity to the time the person disappears or at the point that search and rescue starts. In this incident, there was a huge weather event at about the time she was supposed to meet her husband. Well, she gets separated. Her husband can't find her. He comes back down the trail. He gets uh, the sheriff to come in. Sheriff brings in search and rescue, and they start searching. And they bring in canines. They bring in helicopters. They bring in everything. They bring in the world. And they're not finding anything. And they go seven full days They don't find anything. Dogs don't pick up any scent. There's nothing there. The eighth day, a firefighter from a local jurisdiction that's just way off the grid walks into this area in the woods that's pretty clear on the ground, and there's trees, but there's not a lot of foliage on the ground. And he looks, and he sees a creek, and he sees almost like a campsite that's been destroyed. Things are scattered all over. And the reason I know exactly what he saw is this guy was, took a camera with him during the search, and he took photos. These photos went to the New Mexico State Police, and I got these under a Freedom of Information Act request from them, and I got the photos of the body. He walked up to the creek, and he sees Audrey Kaplan in a fetal position laying in the middle of this creek that's probably four or five inches deep. Now, what's, that's weird. She's completely naked. Her clothes are strewn all over. And the coroner's report states in it that Audrey's face isn't in the water, and there's a picture of her face in the water. Now, the weather wasn't, wasn't cold at all, um, because some people said, well, maybe hypothermia caused her to strip all of her clothes and jump in the creek, and she died from hypothermia. But... In all the reports from the search and rescue, it was all moderate conditions all the time. And the perplexing thing is they had helicopters in the air with speakers. Uh, They had canines all over the area. She was never found until this firefighter is way off the grid, stumbles onto this scene, and finds her body. I never knew that hypothermia could make people take their clothes off, that it provides a false sense of warmth and heat. How often does that happen in these cases? So it's called paradoxical undressing. Now, I've asked some experts this question, and they got upset that I asked them. But I said, okay, if this is happening, then why don't we find naked climbers on Mount Everest and K2? And they looked at me like I was stupid. And they didn't want to answer, and they walked away. 
Sometimes logic doesn't get the best answers, I guess. David, there has always been a little bit of a controversy with your reporting of these cases where there's some people in the field who feel that you're taking advantage of the families that you are that you are exploiting these stories however i don't think you are i know we talked about this on the round table this past friday and my group of uh, people who took part in that felt you do fantastic work for stories that needs to come out but we never hear from the victims what have the victims told you when you have had a chance to talk to the families of these people who've gone missing because they are the victims as well Absolutely. So there's a video at our YouTube channel. That the YouTube channel is Canam Missing Project. If you find a YouTube channel that says David Politis Missing 411, those are all frauds and fakes. 99% of the time, they're not even me on the video that you're watching. So Canam Missing Project. If you go to a video that's there, and it's the premiere of The Hunted, and what happened was is that somebody just happened to be sitting in the audience during the premiere when I was talking and very nonchalantly, a couple of people said, Hey Dave, I want to say something too. I want to say something too. And they were, they were people who we had helped and a victim's family and they came up and they talked about it. And it was, it was humbling. I mean, I, I, I honest to God, I was crying because these people are such good people and they were so happy that anybody cared he said a bunch of great things about me that I, I was blown away. But these families, Dave, after that first seven to ten days when search and rescue gives up and everybody has to go back to work and they have to go home, I cannot imagine leaving a mountain knowing my son or daughter was up there somewhere and I have to leave them there. Even if even if rational thinking tells me that they're not alive, I don't care. The people I've met that had to make that decision, it ruins their life. For somebody to come along and care, to give the case visibility, to talk about the facts and not hide the facts of the case, but talk about them and explain how strange they are, it's like a breath of fresh air to these people. Now, I'm, I'm no great person, but... I think I've seen something and I'm uncovering things that people have glossed over in the years and the families know how odd this is, but, and the search and rescue people do too, but they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to look like they can't control the situation and they don't have logical answers, but every family I have ever dealt with has been overly, overly happy that anybody cared Somebody's giving it attention, and somebody's going to tell the truth about what happened. Well, the way you were coming in, David, with other information that they may not have been told, and being able to put the pieces together with your investigative experiences, I mean, that just has to add to a lot of the allowance of the family to breathe a little bit, that there is another angle that they haven't been told. Oh, definitely. Um Occasionally, there's a, there's a missing person case where a search and rescue commander is interviewed and they look dumbfounded and they can't give a, a logical answer about what happened. And those people, <laughs> those people are, I think, perplexed and compromised. There was a... Uh, a, well, I think he's about 20 years old, named Sagu, S-A-G-O-O, that was with a group of boys in southern D.C., just about 10 miles north of the the border. And uh, he was kind of, this occurred maybe 5, 10 miles east of Chilliwack a number of years ago. And uh, he disappeared from his group that was hiking up a trail. And, he, and then he's found, days later, way in the woods, on a boulder field, dead. And the search and rescue guy said, I don't know how I got there. It doesn't make any sense. And you could tell he's completely flustered. And it's one of those rare times that the truth came out. Now in the movie, I think we're really lucky that we got some search and rescue commanders that were just like you and me, told the truth, were completely flustered, and you could see their emotions. 
it reminds me of that case of that, you know, I know we're, we're not scheduled to talk about this tonight, but that, that young child out of North Carolina this early January, February, who went missing for a couple of days, and all the child said was that he was safe with a bear. Yeah. Now, I know bears in wintertime, they're hungry, they're angry, they're cranky, and they ain't cuddling a three-year-old child and keeping the child warm and safe. That's what it reminds me No, they me aren't. Of. No. You know, I don't know how many times we debated that. Back to the uh, the cluster. This was a case that really intrigued me in the Santa Fe cluster, was Mel Nadal. Now, this is a gentleman very familiar with the area, very familiar with the hunting season, very familiar with his friends who were there, and he had a little bit of a weak ankle, but he goes to his hunting spot in the trees and vanishes like nothing happened. He was never there. Yeah, Mel was uh, a guy who had a bad knee, bad ankle. He was carrying a, a high-caliber pistol, but he was bow hunting. And he'd been to this area many times before. He had met his buddies up there. And he said, hey, I'm going to walk 100 yards. I'm going to go to that clump of trees right there, and I'm going to set up a blind, and I'm going to go elk hunting. One of the things I write about in the books is a lot of people disappear elk hunting, and more people disappear bow hunting than firearms some reason elk hunters disappear and no it's not predation because you'd see drag marks and the things we talked about something else is going on well Nadell walks down there they see him leave at the end of the night he doesn't come back his buddies go down there they can see that he built a blind he cut up some tree branches and such but he's not there and they go that's odd they call for him they fire off three rounds they don't hear anything coming back they get search and rescue. They bring the canines to the scene. Canines rock, walk straight to the blind from his car and stop. Now, that doesn't make any sense. And they search for a week with helicopters, with flare, forward-looking radar, everything. And then we, uh, we talked to Mel's wife, and she said, David, Mel would not walk far. He didn't like to hike. He didn't like to run. He's not going anywhere. He had a bad knee and a bad ankle. He goes, 100 yards was going to be it. And I said, well, does it make any sense that he wouldn't have come right back to the car? No. Mel would have come right back to the car. And when you, when you see it in her eyes, and you see his wife say, something happened, David. I don't know what but something unusual happened to my husband. And when we went up to the area where he disappeared, you have these giant mountains in northern New Mexico that are rolling grassy hills that are spotted with pretty thick foliage of forest, but there's a lot of open area where you could really hunt elk well. And, uh, yeah, Mel was never found, and he's never been found, and it's been, I think, what, 12 years now? His bow and his sidearm were missing as well, were they not? They didn't find anything. And that's the thing on these cases, Dave. They don't find anything. And normal missing people will start dropping things as they get tired. But nothing's ever yeah. found. That's what intrigues me the most is if you're taking a body, I mean, you could use your imagination, whether it's kidnappers, whether if you want to go down the woo road with with aliens and Bigfoot or whomever it is, you would think there would be something left behind a shoe or a a cigarette butt or a weapon. A weapon would be the perfect thing to be left behind. And yet it's all gone. It's it's just vanished like it was never there. That's what I'm I'm having troubles comprehending here. How do you try and figure that out? Or is that the baffling mystery that keeps you scratching your head? Well, I, th I think that's one of those elements that once you get there and you realize that's happened, you're on to something. Wow. Incredible. The last case I want to talk about in regards to m missing 411, the hunted is Aaron Hedges. Now, in the documentary, this blew me away. I mean, here's a healthy guy, 38 years old, been hunting the majority of his life, and 
he just disappears. He has the GPS. You always tell people, bring your GPS. You're always telling people to bring bring what you need. And he just seemed to end up somewhere where he just was never supposed to be. So Hedges knew that area really, really well. It's called the Crazy Mountains in Montana. And it's a big area. And so what we decided to do was uh, we put the sheriff, who was in charge of the search and rescue, in a helicopter with us, and we'd fly the, the route that they searched and he took. Almost from the beginning, some odd things happened. He and his friends were uh, packing into an area, <clears throat> and they had some mules and some horses. And Aaron was walking with his mule, and as they're coming up a ridge, something spooked the mule. And it took off, and Aaron lost a lot of his supplies. Except in prior trips, they had cached supplies up there in this area. So he was fine, and he had a, uh, everyone had walkie-talkies. And the walkie-talkies, when they transmitted, they would put out your GPS location. So they kind of knew where everybody was all the time. And Aaron was kind of a loner guy. He, he, he didn't need help in the woods. He was an expert. But uh, he, he was going to go to this one lake and get some of the cash, and then he was going to meet his friends. And, and during this trip, they kind of lost communication with him for some reason. Now, no one could figure out why. But there's a major creek. It starts as a creek, and it gets into a river that flows down this valley. And everybody knows you follow a creek or you follow a river, and that's going to take you downhill to a, a farm, a ranch, or something. Well, his buddies don't hear from him. They eventually come all the way out of the mountains, and that's a couple-day trip. They get search and rescue, and where he disappears is right on the perimeter of two counties. So these two counties decide that they'll come in from each side, and they'll meet in the middle where Aaron was missing. And they do. And both sides coming in, they don't see any tracks. It had snowed two feet the previous night and a half. So they had fresh snow on the ground, so it'd be easy to find somebody. And that's what they were thinking. And uh, as, they're, as this one county, Sweetgrass County, Montana, is coming up the river, and they're on the trail next to the river, they're not seeing any tracks coming out. They get to the borderline with Park County, and what do they find right next to the river? They find a pair of boots. And they find a, a parts to a water canister from a backpack. And they also find uh, some cut-off straps from a backpack. And nobody can quite make, make out what they're finding, but the sheriff said, well, Dave, when we found the boots, we knew, okay, we're going to find him dead within... 150, 200 yards from hypothermia. But that didn't make sense either because Aaron, he, he had the supplies to survive. And he knew where the cash supplies were at. But they searched this giant area and I don't find anything. And it's a bizarre twist. And they're frustrated. And the canines aren't picking up any scent from that scene next to the water. So... They come out, and they're, they're not finding any tracks leaving. They're coming out a different route. Make a long story short, nothing happens. Months go by. And then a guy who owns a ranch, six air miles from where they found the boots, six air miles, it's probably about a 12-mile hike. He and his dad are fixing a fence line. And his dad goes, hey, look what I found. And he finds a backpack leaning against a tree, with uh, a bow, a gun, and food. And about 15 feet away on a rock is a thermos with a, with a cup. And they go through it, and it was Aaron's backpack, Aaron's gun, Aaron's food, Aaron's water. The sheriff comes back out. Huge search. They don't find anything. Another three or four months go by. There's a dude ranch near maybe three miles away from where they found all these supplies. And this dude ranch runs uh, back or uh, horseback riding trips up into the mountains. And about a mile away from where they found all these supplies, they're riding this trail, and off the trail, somebody thinks they see a skeleton. 
sheriff comes back out and they find this partial skeleton which is later determined to be Aaron. But one of the things I always ask these guys, because it's common, is, well, did you find any shoes? Because there, it maybe he had another pair of shoes. You know, was there anything on his feet? And the sheriff responds, we didn't find any feet. Wow. And I said, well, what'd you find? And he says, well, we found a skeleton and some small bones, and we really didn't find a lot but through DNA, we did determine it was Hedges. Now, here's the weird part, Dave. From where he supposedly sat down and drank and put his backpack, you could see a series of farmhouses and stables where this rancher lived no more than a mile away down the mountain. That's safety. Why wouldn't you head there? Exactly. I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, especially when you are that familiar with the territory, you're that familiar with the hunting game, you're that familiar with the trails that you were walking on. David, the question I have about the boots is we got about a minute and a half here to go, less than that. When people find the shoes, are the laces undone like you or I would untie our laces, or are they scattered, ripped out? That I find fascinating about these shoes or these boots that people are finding. Good question, but it would be nothing that a search and rescue person would ever document. There'd be no reason to. Hey, we found boots. That's it. You got to remember, these search and rescue people are there to search, rescue, and go home. Because 99% of all search and rescue is done by volunteers. They're taking time off of work. They can only take maybe a week off of work at a time, and then they've got to go back and earn a living. And they're not thinking criminal. They're not thinking suspicious. They're just thinking, we're trying to help people here. Wow. See, that's the big thing. Like, I would love to know, like, were they ripped off? Were they in the boots? Because laces tell a lot. Sure. They do. I mean, how many times have we untied hockey skates or our own shoes? You always do it the same way. So that way it's easy for the next time. But I don't know. Maybe that's just my thinking. David, I'm going to get you to hold on. We are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. We are proud to have David Politis on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Missing 411 The Hunted. You want to check out that documentary, his website, canammissing.com. Coming up next, we are going to get in with David about his brand new book, Missing 411 Canada, Unexplained Disappearances. You can find it at any major bookstore online right now. David Politis will return right after this. Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Hey Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. 
The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Come hang out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott SOR. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. SOR archives are free on YouTube, at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And, as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world, and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio, and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there! Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacey, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiele. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. 
Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Dave Scott, your host. We welcome back everyone listening in on WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia. In Dangerfield, Texas, KDNF AM 1560, UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans, in Ridgecrest, California, KZFX 93.7 FM, and KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon. On the digital side, hi to everyone listening in on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Vigility. Vigility is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on the show. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We've got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Do a little shopping at the SOR Vault. Do me the favor. Grab a book at We Read the Night. we got the Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month, and Captain Shirt keeps our news updated daily. David Politis from CanAmMissing411.com is here tonight, and we're going to get into his book, Missing 411 Canada, in just a moment. But his new documentary called Missing 411 The Hunted we're going to stay with that just a little bit longer. David, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for uh, having me there, Dave. Appreciate you taking the time as well. Now, you continued on in this documentary after the Aaron Hedges cases, and, and you headed into California near the Sierras, which is a big mountain range, heavily forested, heavily wooded, lots of wild animals that, that like to chew on people as, as, as food. Let's just get to it. And there's a lot of strange mysteries in those mountains, a lot of weird stuff. And it is also located near Yosemite as well, which is the number one place in North America where people go missing. What is strange about this case? So, like I was saying, is we we had a hundreds of strange stories that came in over the years about things that hunters ran into, hikers ran into, and we siphoned them down to these two incidents that we were going to include in the movie, and these weren't going to be just mere allegations. They were going to be something that science could validate. And the first story uh, at the end of the movie involved a series of hunters. There were five of them that had a hunting camp real deep in the middle of nowhere. And it it was an eight-mile hike on horseback into their hunting camp. And uh, myself and uh, our crew rode in there for a week and spent a week there. And these guys started going there in the late 1940s. And over the years, they had more strange stuff happen to them than we have time to talk about. But, you know, ground, air, everything. So a couple of times in the middle of the night, they had something surround their camp and scare the heck out of them. And what they decided to do was to take these logs with the ca- this cable that they had left over from a lumber camp, and they tied these logs around this uh, cluster of trees so they had a little almost like a fort that they could go into at night and know that they were safe and one of the times the guys came up there this was in 1971 they brought one of these old fashioned reel to reel recorders and they wanted to record the noises that they were, they were hearing in the camp 
Now, if I played these noises for you today and I said, yeah, they were recorded out in the woods, nobody would care. Because of digitalization, we could make anything happen anywhere and make it sound like anything we want. But in 1971, it was different. And they, they came out of the woods and they submitted these tapes to a couple of audio professors at universities. And they said, we want you to tell us what these are. And these two independent professors said, well, we tested them against every known animal in North America. It's not. It's outside the range of a human voice can make, so it's not human. And they had multiple creatures talking over each other with different voices on the same tape, which is impossible to do in 71, but would have even been complicated today. And they found, they had UFOs flying through camp. They had these rods. They actually looked like a, uh, uh, like a stick you'd have at the end of a broom flying through their camp slowly, but with, with thought and in intelligence. And uh, we, we, when we were in there in the camp, nothing, nothing happened. But we sat around the campfire, and one of these hunters came forward and was willing to talk. And there was actually a book written about this in '71 as well. But it's probably some of the best documented creepy stuff in the woods that's ever happened. And uh, Ron Moorhead who's a really good friend, uh, is the guy who did the recording of it, and it's called the Sierra Sounds. And uh, when you hear the sounds in the movie, it'll blow your mind. It, it sounds almost like some type of language, but they're talking maybe a hundred times faster than we're talking right now. And uh, they've taken those tapes and they've slowed them down, they've sped them up. They, have a, they had a crypto-linguist specialist from the Navy even analyze it and he came out and he said, you know, the way that the words are separated and the intellect and dialect in the words, he goes, you could tell they're words and nouns, verbs and nouns. So it's, it's some really, really interesting audio footage to listen to. You know, when I listened to that, last year, Mike Morin from Honda Crew of Canada and I, along with my good friend Mark, were out at Flight 21 in British Columbia here, which is Canada's largest unsolved murder, David. And we were investigating, and we kind of took this deer trail in behind the crash site. And Mark stood by by this giant boulder, and Mike and I walked about 30 yards across this meadow. And the thing that scared me about the Ronald Moorhead tapes, because that was the clearest I've ever heard them on your documentary, was the mumbling type sound about like a right at the beginning. Mike and I heard that clear as day twice, twice. Wow. And it did nothing but put goosebumps all over my body because, you know, hear the Sierra sounds back in 71 from Ronald Moorhead. And now we're hearing this with our bare ears. Like there is this communication happening with us, even though we can't see anything around. It scared the daylights out of us. It literally did. One of the weirdest sounds I have ever heard. Now, in the Donnell Vista disappearances, I mean, this is a place where there's a lot of rock, a lot of granite, a lot of, a lot of high, tall mountain peaks where, you know, it's easy for people to fall. It's easy for people to, to lose their step in, or their, their foot grip and just fall down these cliffs and embankments for hundreds of feet. How do we know that this is strange occurrences rather than somebody just being clumsy? So uh, almost within eyesight of where Moorhead's camp was at, uh, there's, there's this turnout off this major two-lane highway, and it, it's a lookout that looks out over this giant reservoir of nothing but granite. It's like you're almost in Yosemite. It's, there's so much granite. But at this turnout, there's been three people that have disappeared over the years, two women and one man. And, uh, yeah, you could fall, but you're going to fall down into these rocks down below, and canines are going to find you. And uh, the place has been searched umpteen dozen times, and these people are never found. And I, we included it in the movie just because of the proximity and the mystery. And then we even interviewed a reporter from Sonora, California, 
And he said, yeah, it's, it's a huge mystery, and nobody wants to even talk about it now. So when these people go missing, like take, for instance, Brett Phelps. I mean, this is a guy who went fishing. Who doesn't go fishing on their own every now and again? And you immediately think drowning because accidents do happen. But there was nothing of him to be found. They scoured the lakes. They scoured every place to look for him and just poof, gone again. Exactly. It's, uh, in fact, he's one of the rare fishermen that I've ever written about that disappeared. Fishermen are not normally part of that group. Uh, hikers, hunters, but hmm, not fishermen for some reason. But he's one of the rare. In fact, he was a, uh, a Department of Corrections officer in the prison system in California. And uh, he disappeared just like a quarter mile from where these women vanished. And uh, it's it's definitely a cluster right there. There's three people there, and then you go further into the mountains, and that's where this oddity happens in at this hunting camp. Now, with Patty Sue Tolhurst and Nita Mayo, what's the difference between their disappearances in that same area? So Nita Mayo was coming from Nevada into California. She stopped at a local store, bought some items. And she was driving out, and everybody thinks, just like you and me on vacation, you're going to have a look at this lookout because it's it's absolutely gorgeous. And she pulled into the parking lot. Her car's locked. Purse's in the car. She's gone. Nobody knows what happened to her. But she, she vanished. And Patricia Sue Tolhurst lived in Sonora. And people were thinking that uh, she was just going to take a day off and take a look at things that maybe she just doesn't normally have the time to do. And that area, when we were there, is not not that busy. There aren't, you know, 10, 15 people driving through there every hour. There's probably one car every couple hours. So it's remote, it's lonely, but the view is at 10+. plus. So, David, with these cases, you know, like I know in my small area, there are Bushmen out there, okay, who have decided to forego society to kind of live off the grid. How do we know it isn't somebody like them who is, you know, especially with women who maybe hasn't, you know, had a girlfriend in a long time and, and just want some interaction or, or some company? How do we know this isn't happening? You see, in the States contrary than in Canada, we can carry pistols. And I would say at least 50% of the people on the trails in the United States where I'm at are all carrying guns. And we'd be having some dead guys out there on the trail if that was occurring. And uh, I, I, even almost all the women I know, when they go out on the weekends, trail hiking, they all carry guns, pistols. And uh, if that also, if that was occurring, the professional trackers that are brought to the scene, uh, these guys, they're, they're miraculous, miracle workers. They track anything leaving there, and there's no tracks ever leaving these scenes. That'd be another case where if somebody was going to take somebody forcibly and you were going to, let's say, carry somebody, trying to carry somebody 100 pounds any distance at all is not an easy feat, even if you're in good shape. Yeah, I can see that. I can totally see that. It, it's not fun. And, you know, the way everything kind of goes silent here with everything and the way that they are just, you know, not even even having any screams, no, no sounds, no nothing. I mean, I could just imagine, and I try and put myself in that person's position that's disappearing. I could just imagine the fear that they are going through at that time. I, I can't even imagine it. it. It must be off the charts. I'll say this, Dave, that since the movie that Missing from 100 came out, we never expected it to take off like it did. Uh, we, have a, we have a film distributor. He put it on Amazon and iTunes. It's still there. It went to number one in the world on documentaries twice on iTunes, which is unheard of. And uh, we've had... Since that came out, came out in June, I probably had <clears throat> at least 25 different victims' families talk to me 
that have seen the film that have related their story. So it, it's done a lot for us to give us the visibility we want. And uh, there's, there's a specific aspect to the movie near the end where we talk about safety in the woods and uh, carry a personal locator beacon, carry a small emergency blanket, always carry like some energy bars, extra water. And I know this sounds stupid, but it's not. Carry a small whistle. And I know that you, in Canada, you can carry a rifle. In the, in the States, I always tell people carry a pistol because firing off three rounds in rapid succession is, an, is a universal sign of somebody in distress. And uh, hunters know that. And uh, that, that's a really good way to signal that you're in trouble. But uh, everyone should be carrying a personal locator beacon in the woods. And if they did, 95% of the cases I think we research wouldn't be there. At least I'd hope they wouldn't be there. But, uh, yeah, iTunes, Amazon still has the movie. You can get a DVD on our website, canimmissing.com. All right, let's switch over to Missing 411 Canada now, if you don't mind, because, you know, a lot of people don't, like I mentioned right at the beginning of the show, a lot of people don't pay attention to what's happening north of the border. But I know through hockey and through your own experiences, you've kind of found a second home up here in Canada. Why was doing this book so important to you in the Missing 411 series? So I had written about some cases in Canada in my previous books. This is the ninth book in the Missing 411 series. And I knew that Canada had the same sort of strangeness in the cases that we had in the States. Now, I've written about 11 countries that have cases that match what we're talking about. And in order, the, most, the countries with the most is U.S., Canada, U.K., and Australia. And the weirdness is, is that MUFON comes out with a monthly list of the top countries with UFO sightings. And those, those four are always in the top five, which is kind of odd. But uh, Canada, I, I know a lot about Canada. I've been to the Yukon, Northwest Territory, Alberta, British Columbia, Nova Scotia. I've been around your, your great country a lot, and I love it. And it offers some things that we don't see in the States. Namely, you can walk out of Vancouver, and in 20 minutes, you could be in, in the wild and see a grizzly bear. And I don't think there's any place in the States that has a, a city the size of Vancouver where you can step out and see that. So it, it, it's big intrigue. But I started to pay attention to the greater Vancouver area years ago because there were some strange disappearances there that I knew about. And I said, okay, I'm going I'm to spend a year on this and just see what I can find. And just the more I focused on Vancouver Island and the greater Vancouver, North Vancouver, Garibaldi Provincial Park, going kind of an arc circle going all the way over to uh, Penticton and Kelowna, Kamloops, that area has so many people that have disappeared and never been found. It's, it's very odd. It really is. Now, you say that the Vancouver area and the North Vancouver area with the Cascade Mountains is literally number two to Yosemite. Why is that? So, in the, I've never done this before, but in that book, Canada, Missing 411 Canada, I included a 24 by 36 inch map. I've never put a map in a book before, but it's important because this map shows British Columbia and that area that I just spoke about. And then in the top right corner of the map is a, is a close up of greater Vancouver. Now, when, when I talk to you about these, it's hard to visualize how many people are missing. If you can't put it on a map and look at it to me, it's like a crime scene and I'm looking to see where these crimes are happening. And son of a gun, if, if there aren't these clusters of disappearances in your country, just like there are in, in our country. And there, on the island, there's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen 12, 14 people that have never been found. And there's, there's little clusters there. Um, in the Strait of the Juan de Fuca, uh, that's the, the piece of water between Vancouver Island and the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. 
You can't see this on the map, but I talk about it at conferences. There's a series of boys, young men, that are, are missing on Vancouver Island. And on the Olympic Peninsula, there's a series of boys on the coast of the Olympic Peninsula that have disappeared. What separates Vancouver Island from the Olympic Peninsula? The Strait of Juan de Fuca. It's, it's just a very, very odd coincidence. This, this little strait, and we have disappearances on both sides. Like I was saying, water. And then when you look at the, uh, the uh, inset in the top right corner of the map that has the city of Vancouver, there's somebody missing out by UBC. There's, there's two people missing uh, north of Horseshoe Bay. Uh, there's two people missing, uh, just coincidentally, the, two of the only women in the area are missing right in the Wind Valley, never been found. And uh, then as you go further north, there's, there's a whole cluster of missing people. It intrigues me. It very much intrigues me, especially, you know, for me, I know all of these areas. I know these areas. I know exactly where you're talking about. Lynn Canyon is very deadly with the river. A lot of people uh, drown there every year in regards to it. But, I mean, you look at the mountains. There's three mountains, ski mountains, right in a row. There's Cypress, Seymour, and Grouse. And usually one or two skiers a year who end up going out of bounds disappear. No trace whatsoever. And I'm... I don't know if it's the energy, the vortexes, if, it, you know, there's been numerous UFOs spotted over the area, whether it's people, whether it, it's just so so hellacious of an area that they can't get to the bodies. I don't know, Dave. And I guess that's part of the entire mystery, isn't it? Of course. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't hear about UFOs in, in that area. You would because of your show, but... I don't hear about them here, and when I hear about them, I think, well, that's, that's kind of odd that you guys have a lot right there, right? Yeah, that entire lower mainland area. The entire lower mainland area north of the Fraser River has a lot of weird, strange things. It starts in North Vancouver, and I'll tell you, one of the scariest pieces of road that I have ever driven is in between Whistler and going into the canyon to a town called Cash Creek. I have never been more scared in my life driving that road, ever. Weird energy, weird energy, tight corners, way up in the mountains, and then right down, you don't know if you come around a corner and you're going to get smoked by a moose or, or a bear. It is scary. And that's just to say how eerie it is on a real-life level. David, I'm going to get you to hold on here for just a moment. We are going to go to break at the bottom of the hour. David Politis, Missing 411 Canada. His latest book can be found at every major bookstore out there, as well as his website, canammissing.com. You want to check it on out? More with David Politis on Spaced Out Radio right after this. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look Beyond the Spectrum, a new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and Bigfoot in the forest. Truth seekers like Steve Bassett, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Richard Dolan, as well as others all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. 
Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptic Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptic Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Finish off your weekend and kick off your new week with me, Everett Themer, right here on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to bring you great guests, a little bit of snark, and plenty of information to think about. But don't worry, there's going to be plenty of woo as well. We are going to hit everything in the paranormal and supernatural, including the odd psychic Sundays. So tune us in on Sunday, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 
12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Past the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Got to clear something up right off the bat. The only place you can get can- uh, Missing 411 Canada or any other of David Politis's books is on his website, canammissing.com. Canammissing.com. It's not on Amazon, not in any online store. They keep it right there for themselves. So go to canammissing.com to order up your books. Reminder, our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. Do a little shopping at the SOR vault. Pick up a book at We Read the Night. We got the Space Travelers Club for five bucks a month, and Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire is updated daily. David Politis is with us. We're talking his latest book, Missing 411 Canada, Unexplained Disappearances. Once again, you can find it only at canammissing.com. Com. David, welcome back. Hey, thanks, Dave. It's easy to go to the more populated areas and talk about the clusters, and especially around Vancouver. But one of the stories in your new book that really stuck out with me was going back to 1966, a young lad, nine years old, Clancy O'Brien. Now, he disappeared about 30 miles south of me at a place called Green Lake, And I have to tell you, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but Green Lake in our area has a very vast history of UFO sightings, UFO landings, and Bigfoot sightings as well. I I never knew that. Yeah, it's absolutely strange how many people I talk to, and when I talk to them about, you know, what I do and everything like that, the first place they always point out, have you been to Green Lake? So to find this story in your book absolutely sent goosebumps down me, my friend. Tell me a little bit about this story about Clancy. So when I start a story, uh, first, Clancy O'Brien, he's nine years old, uh, happened August 20th, 66. And right below that header, I list some points that are profile points to this story. And to this story, the first profile point is this berries. Second one is point of separation. That means when you're with somebody and you're no longer with them, you walk around the corner, that's a point of separation, and things tend to happen then. And water and canines. So there's four on these. Clancy and his parents lived in Vancouver. His father was a teamster. And the family decided to take a vacation, and they drove 30 miles north of Clinton and approximately 200 miles north of of their residence to Green Lake. And on August 20, 66, the family went to visit a friend who was a rancher just outside of Green Lake Provincial Park. And they were having a picnic at the ranch with the ranchers and their friends. And when Clancy left to go get some hot dogs for himself and his friends that were in the cabin, just not too far from where they were having the picnic. But Clancy got out of view, didn't return. Parents asked where he went. They said he went to the cabin. Parents got up, went to the cabin, didn't see him. And now all of a sudden, everyone's pretty frantic. And everybody stops eating. Everyone starts combing the ranch. And the rancher decides to call RCMP. First RCMP on the scene says, wow, this could be difficult because it's a pretty big area. He calls for more assistance. And within hours, they had 150 locals and RCMP and firefighters looking for the boy. Within a day, there were 25 equestrians, three helicopters, multiple tracking dogs, and 250 volunteers that were looking through the area. Well, the Teamsters on the second day heard about this. They filled five buses with Teamsters. They shut down part of Vancouver, and 250 Teamsters joined the search. Now, articles at the time stated that the boy couldn't have starved in the area, and they weren't worried about him not eating because all the berry bushes in this area were ripe. Now, in Missing 411 Eastern U.S., I wrote an entire chapter about missing berry pickers. So when I read this, 
it's interesting, Dave, the way you say everyone looks at it a different from a, their own per, educated perspective. I saw this and I thought, wow, berries are ripe. That's interesting. So the search for Clancy lasted 13 days, which for 1966 was a long search. Normally in 66, they would last five days. So they gave, they gave this a big push. The RCMP said that they thought they had found small tracks several hundred yards from where he was last seen. And this was on the fourth and fifth day. They put the canines on it. Canines showed no interest, so, so they disregarded it. Nothing related to Clancy was ever found. Search and rescue manuals state that a nine-year-old boy will be found 95% of the time in a radius of 4.5 miles from the place they were last seen. So that's where 99% of this effort was focused. And what the perspective I want people to think about, a nine-year-old boy is going to a picnic. He's hungry. He's going to go get some hot dogs. That kid is going to have a one-track mind. Get the hot dogs, get them on the barbecue, and let's start eating. So any thought that he wandered away voluntarily looking for something else, I don't buy that. Something unusual happened here. Because in all of those years, he was never found. It's amazing. That, that's absolutely amazing. Because knowing that area, the amount of people who travel to Green Lake or who have cabins or cottages around Green Lake, there is people there all year round. Doesn't matter if it's wintertime, summertime, where it's one of the most beautiful areas. It's got that pristine green water that just glows. It's just beautiful. And the fact that nobody saw this young lad just disappear without a trace, it's baffling to me. It's absolutely I baffling. Think, I think you've got to remember, too, that they weren't having a picnic like at a public campground where maybe he was abducted. They were on a private ranch. So to me, that even offers more intrigue. It's very thick and dense out there as you as you start to leave the the lake shore. Very thick and dense. And, you know, all you have to do is climb up on one of the hills to see how thick the trees are in that area. Well, most of them are burnt down now after the fires a couple of years ago. But in a case like this, Dave, you know, with your experience, do you think those bones or his body or anything will ever be found maybe 10 years from now, 30 years from now, that somebody will just stumble across them? Does that happen? So kind of the way you have to think about this is our forests are very efficient at getting rid of things. And if you think about a, a deer laying in the woods, in your woods, in our woods, in two weeks, there, you won't find anything there. I can think of the amount of time, the tens of thousands of hours I've spent hiking in the woods, and I've seen deer bones. I've never seen bear bones. I've never seen a skeleton of a bear. I've seen some elk skeletons, but I know how many bears are out there, but I've never seen a bear skeleton. Now, in a small boy's incident, those bones are going to get dissipated and eaten by small rabbits or squirrels and etc. But if there's leather shoes or if there's a leather belt or there's anything metal, that may last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years. But the clothing, that's going to dissipate quickly, and so are those bones. So any chance of, a, of finding a small child in the woods after three or four years, almost nothing. All right, let's move to another interesting case of a child because, you know, as a parent, I think we can all relate to this being our biggest fears. And this one is out of Alberta, the province over for our American friends who are unfamiliar with Canada's provinces. It goes British Columbia, then Alberta, of two-and-a-half-year-old Helen Bogan. Now, when I was reading this, this one literally scared me because a child is there then she's not there, and then she's back. August 7th, 1950, another August case. Uh, this one happened at 10 a.m., two and a half years old, and the profile points is weather, missing clothing, area previously searched, water, and point of separation. The town is called Monitor, Alberta, small city, 200 miles north of Edmonton, 
about 10 miles southeast of a place called Gooseberry Lake Provincial Park. And in this area, if you look at it on a Google map, there's just hundreds of small lakes, bogs, swamps, lots of water in the area. Well, at 10 a.m., two of the Bogan kids were mounting their horses for a ride to their grandparents' home. Helen, at two and a half years, wanted to go with them. Parents said no. Kids said, you stay here, and the kids rode off. Soon after they left, the parents started looking for Helen, and they couldn't locate her. Well, the parents searched their yard, then started to call for neighbors. They're yelling for their daughter. They're not getting an answer. And it wasn't long before 150 locals arrived and were looking for the young girl. And uh, people may think that's odd, but when you read these older stories, these remote communities really rallied around each other. And when something happened, they came to each other's aid quickly. And uh, this search went nonstop for 24 hours. And they lit fires in the hills. And the idea behind that is is that a small kid will walk toward the fire. And uh, knowing that there's somebody there, well, the neighbors were yelling the entire time for Helen, and they couldn't get a response. And the police responded a couple hours later with canines from Westlock. And the police specifically stated that none of their dogs could pick up a scent. And then two private planes from Provost responded. They flew the skies around the area looking for the girl. They didn't see anything. So at the 29th hour, there were 450 locals searching and just scouring that area. They weren't finding anything, and they weren't finding tracks. At hour 30, locals were searching an abandoned farm when a severe thunderstorm hit the region. Well, they didn't find anything at the farm, and they turned around and went back. An hour later, hour 31, the rain had stopped, and a woman, Mrs. Douglas Tainch, was back at that farm by herself, searching an hour after this last group had left, and she thought she heard something in this abandoned home on the farm. And she walks in, and she sees a young girl, and this is a quote from the newspaper, naked and splashing happily in an old dirty tub of water inside of a small shed on the abandoned farm is 30-month-old Helen Bogan. She was hungry and weak but alive. Now, the searcher found it amazing that she lived for 30 hours in the bush, Now, Helen spoke to her dad and said she spent the previous night on a local hill. Now, that statement was impossible to everybody involved in this search because every hill and every mound had fires on it. There were no tracks. There was no scent trail. They had the point of separation. She was missing clothing. Weather played into this. The area where she was was previously searched. And why wasn't she cold? This baffles me because, I mean, when every hill has some sort of sight line on it with fire or people, you'd expect them to be able to hear or see a young child who's on a hill. Did the child ever say, David, in your research, whom she was with or what she was with? You know, there's a story that I wrote about in B.C., and I've written so many of them, I don't remember the name, but... It was a small boy. He was on a lake. He disappears. And they, they send dozens of people out, and they're searching, 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 and they're not finding anything. And then, like the seventh day, this boy, young boy, like I think he was four years old, comes walking out of the forest downhill towards the lake. And they ask the boy, they go, where are you at? Where have you been? Who's been taking care of me? He goes, Oh, a man and a, a, a young boy in an orange hat. And they said, what? And there's RCMP everywhere. And he said, oh, a young boy in an orange hat helped me and then walked me back and stopped and said, oh, there's your folks. You go to them. And so the RCMP sent 100 guys out there into the woods. They never found this guy in the orange hat. They have no idea what he was talking about. They had searched that area 100 times over the previous eight days. But that's an example of where where is the guy in the orange hat? Why wouldn't he make himself known? And the area where this kid came out of was like nothing but woods for 20 miles. 
Incredible. It almost like it's almost like they just walked right from another dimension right back into this one. I mean, with this little girl, I mean, if she's sitting on the mountains right there, why couldn't they have found her? And then to find her in a house that had already been searched. Kids are loud when they're awake. They're loud. They're not, and when they're not loud, they're dangerous. I think we all know that as parents. But it just doesn't make sense of how, you know, these areas, whether, you know, with this young Helen Bogan, where she was found alive, or other people who were found deceased, w- through areas where they have been searched multiple times, especially when you have the investigators going through and the searchers going through a line where there's a person, say, every 8 to 10 feet. I mean, this is baffling, Dave. Yeah, and that's it, the more you get into it, and you, if I gave you twenty cases, and I say you pick out the ones that match after you've read this book, you could go through there and pick out the ones that you could say, oh yeah, that's a match, and this one's a match, and that one's not, but this one is, and it it becomes pretty easy to tell that something else is at play. But what is? I don't know. There's there's other stories I've written about. There's a case out of Australia where in the early 1900s there was a they didn't call him policeman, but there was something else for a guy who rode a horseback and had a territory in Australia. And he rode into this camp where these natives were living, and they said, oh, you're going to see something strange. I wrote this story in the book, and he wrote about it in his ledger, and he said, I went to this area, and it was near a lake. And these natives said, you're going to see something strange. Watch. And he says, one of our native elders is going to go to the water, and he's going to disappear. And this elder walked near the water, and the air above started to swirl like a thunderstorm and he said that you heard lightning and thunder and the, everything lit up in the sky and then he said there was the loudest thunder he ever heard and he goes the guy was standing next to the bank and then all of a sudden he wasn't and this policeman wrote in his in his ledger and I, I included it in one of the books I wrote because it was it was an encompassing story of all these profile points but this guy purposely went down there this elder to do this which was weird Incredible. Incredible. We have about five and a half minutes here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour. David Politis is our guest. I think we have time to maybe sneak one story in. If we have to, we could carry it over. I'm thinking we should talk about Ashley Christensen because this is another interesting case of a young child, eight years old, in Tinsdale, Saskatchewan, who just vanished. Her clothes were missing as well. So point of separation, water, weather, missing clothing, and she she was a twin, which is something I'm starting to pay attention to because there's more than a, a, a small percentage of twins that I've noticed have disappeared. So July 14th, 1994, her and her twin sister, Lindsay and Ashley, and the mom went to a place called Burial, Barrier Chaparral Vacation Ranch on the outskirts of Tisdale. And the ranch is described in, a, in their brochures as a prairie ranch with wide open spaces, physical activities, trail rides, canoeing, fishing, trap shooting, just like a fun area to go. Well, the area surrounding the ranch is part of the First Nations property. So the, the mother had to leave and uh, do something off site. So she left the girl on the property and they'd been there for many, many times. And the girls decided that they were going to go on a horseback ride with some friends. And they would have a race back to the stables. Well, Ashley told her friends that she knew a shortcut and took another trail. And her sister, Lindsay, and another friend took another trail. Well, Lindsay and the friend get back, and the sister's gone. Ashley's nowhere to be found. And so they get a hold of the ranch, and the ranch gets a hold of all their ranch hands, and they search the trail. And this trail, Dave, is really, really big, thick. You're not going to miss it. You know which way to go. Lashley's dad worked for the Canadian Highway Authority. He gets notified, and he gets a series of MP- RCMP in there, and they arrived in force, and they just start scouring the whole place. Within three days, there's four canine units, four airplanes, one Army helicopter equipped with FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, and 500 searchers. The helo pilot and spotter did low flyovers with the flare looking for any heat signature. They found none. The ranch was thick with swamps, grass, and parts with thick foliage. The search area was inundated with heavy rain for the first three days. 
and that compromised the search. What baffled investigators was the path that Ashley took was so easy to follow. There's no way you could have gotten lost. Well, after two weeks of not finding everything, anything, the government calls off the search. And the termination angered local residents, and so they gathered together and they continued on. And the government's theory was that Ashley couldn't have survived more than 14 days and that she was dead. So they thought they could give up. Well, there was nothing new about that disappearance until two months later when the vanishing reappeared on the second week of September. A hunter deep, deep into the bush found a young girl's skeleton 3.125 miles east and 4.3 miles south of the ranch in an area described as extremely thick and rugged with vegetation. The RCRMP reported that it was Ashley, and she was found wearing girl shorts and one shoe. No shirt, and she was missing a shoe that was never found. The area is processed like a crime scene. Nothing was found. The RCMP stated they never searched this area because they never believed that she could have gotten into that area based on how rugged the region was. The search for Ashley was described as the largest at its time in that area of Alberta. The government threw every conceivable technological resource into finding Ashley. There was no cause of death ever given. And it was very similar to a case I wrote before about Corey Kelly. And we could talk about that later if you want. Absolutely. You know, when you hear of these young girls, you know, or young children, do you think that they are targeted? I realize a lot of your cases deal with people of all ages, but are we just more emotional to the children's cases or do they seem to just pop out a little bit more? So when I was a policeman and I worked in a big city, when a child disappeared, we would think that eh, there's a possibility they were targeted because uh, people take the same routes back and forth to school, back and forth to the store, in your neighborhood seeing friends. But think about the remote opportunity any predator would have if they were going to single out a child in the middle of a ranch. You would never know that child was going to go on a horse race or where they were going to be time to time. You'd never know. I I just now they were out riding on horses, were they not? Yeah. So where was the horse? That's the million dollar question too. That the story and there was nothing anywhere about what happened to the horse. Wow. Wow. Because you think that horse would either stay by the child or come back down the 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 trail. That should have well, been easy I, I to if, track. I think if the horse was hers it would have that connection. But since it was just a ranch and they were just visiting, yeah. every time I've rode at a ranch or a stable or somewhere, that horse just wanted to get back to his stall as quick as he true. could. That That is true, too. That is true, too. we got a few of those around our area here as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways, we're going to take a break here at the top of the hour. Missing 411 Canada, David Politis' latest book. You can find it at canammissing.com. We got more stories from Missing 411 Canada and Mr. Politis right after this to start Hour 3 of Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. 
We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiele. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache. 
so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor third and final hour of spaced out radio is underway tonight i am your host dave scott thank you so much for being with us we welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates wqee 99.1 fm in noon in georgia uprn 107.7 fm in new orleans in ridgecrest california kzfx 93.7 93.7 FM, KDUN AM 1030 in Reedsport, Oregon, and down in Dangerfield, Texas, KDNF AM 1560. On the digital side, we say hello to everyone listening in on Kingdom of Nye Radio and Revolution Radio. Remember, all of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Vigility. Vigility is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, do some shopping at the vault, and join the Space Travelers Club for five bucks a month. For the final time tonight, we introduce the head of Missing 411, David Politis, Can-Am Missing Dot com is the website where you can pick up all of his nine books, including his latest, just released last week, Missing 411 Canada, Unexplained Disappearances. David, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Dave. Now, this case, it the minute I heard about it on the news, I knew you were going to be looking into this, and I actually was stalking your Facebook profile to see what you were going to say about this. This is about Daniel Philippidis, a gentleman who went with friends skiing, disappeared, and then reappeared on the West Coast. Yeah, this was an odd case. I, the day it happened, I I was paying 100% attention to it. Uh, a 49-year-old Toronto fire captain He'd been in the fire department for 28 years. He and a, a group of current firefighters and some retired ones crossed the border and went to a place called Whiteface Mountain Ski Resort in Lake Placid, about 40 miles south of Canada. And they'd done this several times over the years. Well, Danny and a group of guys were skiing together all day, and some of the guys got tired, and Danny said, well, I think I'm going to take one last run. And it was about 4 o'clock. And what's interesting about that is in several of my books where I have the list and the stats of what's happened to these people, the time of occur- the most common time for someone to disappear is 4 o'clock under our profile. So he went right at 4 o'clock. Well, he was by himself on the last run of the day. He never showed up. They didn't find him. His street shoes and other property was in the lodge. His car was in the parking lot. Everybody hit the slopes again. There was a giant search that went into darkness. Then they called in the police and search and rescue personnel. And they, did, they were searching for him for six days. 7,000 hours was contributed with search dogs and other firefighters. He's found February 13th, 
six days later in California at a Sacramento airport rental car area. Now, he was wearing his ski clothes and still had his ski helmet. He told the sheriff that he thought he had some type of head injury, but he wasn't sure. And he was dropped in downtown Sacramento by a trucker. And he was asked to describe the trucker, and he said he, said he couldn't. He goes, I really can't remember. I, I think I slept most of the time or something. Well, in that time, since February, no trucker has ever come forward saying he gave him a ride. Uh, Danny has no memory of what happened. But when he got into Sacramento, it was kind of strange. He got a haircut. He bought a new iPhone because he didn't have his. And he called his wife from Sacramento. Now, he did go back and he met with New York State Police in Lake Placid. And they didn't release a lot of information about what happened. And he was initially under some medical care, but soon after this, he was cleared and he went back to work at Toronto Fire. This is a fascinating story because you have someone, and I don't know if people know this, but to be a fireman or a policeman in a metropolitan area of Canada or the U.S., you've got to go through a series of psychological tests. So this guy isn't some wacko guy. He's a very stable guy to be a captain in Toronto. And... He was as perplexed as anybody about what happened to him. And they interviewed one of the sheriff's deputies from Sacramento, the first had contact with him, and he said, no, the guy was was not right. Something was wrong, and he knew it, and he felt bad that he couldn't explain himself. So I don't know what happened, but I think it's odd. Do people like this go through some sort of hypnotherapy regression to try and figure out what happened to them? Has that worked, or is because hypnotherapy is considered such a such a controversial type of investigation that you don't really put much fact into it? I think you have to, first of all, have a cooperative victim that wants to go through it, and then you have to have a competent hypnotherapist, which may be hard to find sometimes, but I think it'd be fascinating if if he went through it. I'm just blown away by this case because, I mean, this gentleman, you know, he had no ID on him. Where did he get the money from if he didn't have his wallet? He had a credit card. Now, don't most places in the United States, David, ask for ID? for the usage of a credit card? Uh, not really. No, not anymore. Not if you have the chip. Hmm. And yet he could, he can't remember where he was, but he could, or how he got there, but he can remember his wife's name, her phone number, the pin to his credit card. No, I don't, so I don't think you need a pin for a, if you have a chip on a credit card, you just insert it into the machine and it does its thing. See, but here, he did you're... remember. He did remember his wife's phone number. See up here, which you is need pretty to... weird. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. In this day and age, I don't think I remember anybody's phone number on a smartphone. No, and you see up here, you do have. If the purchase is over a hundred dollars, you do have to put in a PIN code. Really? Yeah. Huh? No, you don't have to in the U.S. Weird. Very strange. Now, has this guy, I'm not sure if you've done any follow-up with Daniel Philippidis, but has he ever recalled any further um, information about this, or has he been told to keep it silent by investigators? He did give an interview to, I think, CTV, but he didn't say a lot in the interview. He said almost all the things I just said, that he was concerned and he didn't know, and I think that if I was in that position, I don't know if I would talk to anybody about it because I'd be embarrassed because I couldn't answer for myself. And I think that if, if this truly happened, like he said, and it happened to you, I think you'd be not only embarrassed, but disturbed that it happened. Very true. We have a number of listeners in Nova Scotia. And this is why I chose this case from your book, Canada, Missing 411 Canada, Unexplained Disappearances. It's of Marty Leger. 
Now, this is a 30-year-old man. Once again, as you just said, 4 o'clock seems to be the magic hour where people go missing. That's when he disappeared near Spider Lake, Waverly, Nova Scotia. What happened there? This is a strange one. Uh, 30 years old. Profile points are weathers and canines. And there's more people missing in Nova Scotia than logically should be. But when you see the amount of water that surrounds this area, and you think about what I've said in the past, water comes into play. Well, Marty left his home in Halifax May 29th and drove to a remote region northeast of Waverly. And he drove to a location called Spider Lake, and he parked at the dead end of this dirt road. Well, he was a big guy, six foot two sixty. He got out his mountain bike, took off riding down the trail. And he had told his family that uh, when he left at noon that he'd be back at about 4 o'clock. Well, when he didn't arrive home, the family drove to the lake, knew where his car would be, and found it there at 8.30 at night. And they immediately got on the phone, called in a missing person report, and the RCMP responded. The area could best be described as super thick with swamps, lakes, and burrows, a very thick bush around the swamps. Well, the formal search was orchestrated by RCMP started the following day, May 30th, and the articles described it as one of the largest search and rescues in the history of Nova Scotia. Three helicopters, 450 searchers, boats, planes, search dogs. One of the helicopter pilots was interviewed, and he said, hey, I've been on a lot of searches. I've never seen anything this huge. So they were throwing a lot of resources at Fine and Marty. The commanders stated that they covered 60 square kilometers with multiple helicopters multiple times, covering land, swamps, and lakes. And they used the helicopters with FLIR looking for a heat signature. They found none. The Canadian military even sent 200 soldiers that walked the bush and swamps. It was one of those weird days out there in Nova Scotia. It was 90 plus for five days in a row and it exhausted the searchers. When the SAR was eventually ended, the commander stated they had not located anything. So the question is, why didn't FLIR pick up a heat signature of Marty? Why didn't canines that were there pick up a scent? Why didn't 200 soldiers find anything related to the victim? And it's now been five years, and nothing's ever been found. Did they send divers into the swamps, in the waterways in the area? They did. And nothing there. No. What about what about underground streams where, you know, you hear all these stories of people go, say they drown in a lake and they end up in a river, you know, 10 miles away, something along those lines. Were there underground streams that, that have to be worried about? I don't think in this area because it's pretty flat. It. it Streams usually have where, where there's gravity and the water can go somewhere. Here, it's pretty flat. Hmm. Now, was this guy somebody who was normally out in the wilderness by himself? Or was this just a a day where he wanted to enjoy nature? Now, he'd gone to this location several times in the past and rode, and he knew that area. So the the family knew exactly where he was going. There seems to be a little bit of a tie to the curse of Oak Island with this one. You know, uh, here's a little story for you. Earlier this year, there was a special on TV, and you can watch it on Amazon. It was done by the History Channel, and it was a two-hour special about my work. And it was called Vanished. And if you Google it on Amazon, I think you can watch it for like two bucks. It's a two-hour special. It has really good reviews. Well... The company that did that was Prometheus Productions that I worked with for six months to do that. It's also Prometheus Productions that does the the Oak Island. And we used to have all kinds of talks about uh, the disappearances in Nova Scotia and if they were related somehow to what's going on there. So it's interesting you brought that up. Yeah, it's it's very interesting indeed because, you know, I have a question from Joe here. He's asking, was the bike ever found? No. Which goes to that what we've talked about, the equipment, the things that, that are with you, they're never found. 
Now, the bike is something that, that's a great question. That's something that should have been found. Yeah, totally. Totally. No clothing found, nothing. No. And, you know, that bike, they could find that 20 years later. So the body may not be around, but that bike is going to be there. I'm going to find it in a tree that's grown through it. So it's going to happen. Or, or, or the bike fell on the tree. Could very well. Could very well. See, this is this is part of the thing that I don't understand. And, and, you know, and I say this jokingly, but that's where I always tell my audience, you've got aliens. When something weird happens, you've got aliens. Because I just don't see, you know... Even even if it was a kidnapper or or let's just say something mythical like a Sasquatch, I don't see a Sasquatch taking taking a bike saying, "Hey, we're going to go for a ride after we do in this guy." I just don't see that happening. That'd be a <laughs> cool sighting report, though. It would. That would be the one that we want. That would totally be the one that we want. But I just don't see it happening. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine Bigfoot on those little pedals? I mean, my goodness. But, you know, this is happening all too often. All too often. Let's get to our final one here because we only got about six and a half minutes left. And we're going to head to the province of Ontario, Deep River. And back in 2010, a 41-year-old man named Lachlan Cranswick, just once again enjoying nature, doing the things that he does, and poof, disappears. So he's, he's from Melbourne, Australia. He was uh, a physicist working at the Atomic Energy of Canada Deep Water Labs, and he was doing research on radioisotopes, and he was an expert on powder diffraction. And I actually looked up what powder diffraction was, and it was so many big words, I didn't understand it, and there's probably somebody in your brilliant audience that did, but I couldn't pronounce the word, so I'm not going to try but on January 18, 2010, at 4.30, Lachlan was seen getting on a bus at the labs expected to be home. On January 23rd, five days later, he was expected at a curling championship at Deep River Curling Club, where he was the vice president. He wasn't there. Club member calls RCMP, and they go to Lachlan's home. What they find is they find his garbage can sitting at the curb line, in a typical housing track that sits a thousand feet southwest of the Ottawa River. And the city of Deep River sits just northeast of Algonquin Provincial Park. Officers found the front door unlocked, Lackland not home, car in the garage. His personal items, including a GPS unit, keys, and a wallet, were found on the counter in the home along with his personal computer. The garbage cans were outside, and they were placed outside on January 18th, or the night he would have gotten home. The RCMP called for search teams immediately, surrounded the home, the neighborhood, everything. They didn't find anything. A ski club checked nearby trails, didn't find anything. It was January 23rd. Everything was frozen solid. They bring in the canines to track the scent. They don't track anything leaving the home, and there's no tracks leaving the home. So they put new locals out near the streets, the harbors, and the river. They don't see anything. Police stated that the river was frozen solid with only a few open patches in the marina, and you could only see those if you're in a helicopter. At the time Lackland vanished, the ice was four feet thick, according to the RCMP. Lackland's brother, Rupert, flew in from Melbourne. The brother made this statement to the news. The circumstances of the disappearance are just bizarre. I talked to lots of locals, and they think something extraordinary happened to him. End of quotes. Nothing happened on this case for six months. June 11, 2010, two canoeists were in Welsh's Bay east of Deep River Marina and found a floating body in two and a half feet of water. The coroner stated it was Lachlan. He was found wearing his work coat and lab ID. No cause of death was ever released by the coroner. The brother stated that the police have no clue what happened to his brother. Some believe that he went for a walk at 11.30 p.m. on a frigid January night. Refer to Missing 411 as sobering coincidence. This book that I wrote chronicles a series of smart men who all disappeared and were found in bodies of water, many unknown cause of death. And that's all this book is about, young, intelligent men who disappeared 
Nobody saw them disappear, and they were later found in a body of water. This almost sounds like a case, David, on the East Coast where all of these young men in Boston are, have gone missing. Some have claimed it's that uh, group, the Smiley Face Killers. This is almost identical to that. So I, I wrote about the Smiley Face Killers in, in the book I wrote, and I what I stated was they wrote about maybe 12 cases. I wrote about 60 cases and never in any of those 60 cases was there a smiley face ever found in any of the scenes I wrote about. But the detectives that started that case, it was a detective out of New York did something brilliant. And he started to pay attention to these missing person cases, just like I am. And he was working in New York, and somebody disappeared in one part of New York, but his body's found upstream, upriver from where he disappeared. And he said, how did that body get upriver? It should be downriver. And then they started doing autopsies, and they couldn't figure out a cause of death, and et cetera, et cetera. All of these people were ending up in water that made no sense. Do we know if his body was bloated as what normally happens if it's been submerged? They, they didn't release any details about the body, and they never wow. released a cause of death, which is really weird. Now, and I'm not my, too sure my, how the, the Freedom of Information Act works in Canada, but have you, have you tried a FOIA request for that? I've tried several times, and there's a case out of British Columbia where a guy disappeared, and his wife was working with me on the case. And I filed first, and she filed second, and we both got three pages that was 90% blacked out. His wife appealed and they said, no, we can't release any more details other than that. And really it was a bunch of ands, thes, yous. You, you couldn't tell what happened. Oh my but goodness. It was frustrating. David, we got about a minute to go here on Spaced Out Radio with you tonight. And I'll tell you, I've waited three and a half years to interview you about one of your books and this is everything that I had hoped for, if not more. And I think by the reaction of our listeners in the chat rooms and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, they are pretty much saying the same thing. So thank you so much for, for allowing us the opportunity to have you on our show. Hey, Dave, I had, a, I had a good time, and I'm glad we were able to get together and talk about this. And you're a good host, and I, I appreciate being on your show. What's up next for you, my friend? we got about 30 seconds. You know, uh, we're probably going to go into pre-production on movie number three since this last movie did so well, and uh, not sure what it's going to be about yet, but we're talking about it. So uh, get out, and the movie's pretty cheap to watch. Take a view. Absolutely, my friend. And continued success with your research, and hopefully one day you get to find some answers that you are looking for in your research as well, because in the end, that's all, what we all want. David, thank you so much for coming on. David Politis, his website, canammissing.com. That's where you can buy all nine of his books, including Missing 411 Canada, his latest book, unexplained disappearances you got to check this one out definitely worth the read i have it in my hand i want you to have it in your hand too coming up next we have the sor newswire and the thought of the day stay tuned more spaced out radio right after this We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com.
Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. A little bit of science, a little bit of skepticism. Add a dash of snark and you have the makings of Spaced Out Sundays with me, Everett Thiemann. Together we will look into the reality of the paranormal with an open eye and rational thought. Oh, did I mention there'll be plenty of woo as well? Your time spent with Spaced Out Sundays will make the night even better. The chat rooms are open, 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, right here at spacedoutradio.com. You want a new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. At spacedoutradio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Move over, brother, and let me own Saturday night. This is Rich Giordano, and I'm inviting you to tune on in to Spaced Out Saturday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, where I'm going to bust open the lids on everything paranormal. Why? Because we want answers, and I'm the guy who's going to deliver those answers to you. Join the chat rooms, and we'll see you this Saturday. Just be there. No, really. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. 
night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us. Wow, what a power interview with David Politis. I got to admit, I was a little nervous. You know, like, there are certain big names in this field that it's very hard to get them on shows. We've done it twice now this year with David Politis tonight, George Knapp earlier on in the year. And when you have someone of that stature, of that credibility, of that intrigue, you know, when you interview them for the first time, you want to make sure everything is perfect. So I was a little nervous tonight for that, but I'm glad it went well. I hope you all enjoyed that. Hey, I want to remind all of you that you can check out our archives for this show and others for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can join the Space Travelers Club for five bucks a month. You can do a little shopping at the SOR Vault. Pick up a great book at We Read the Night. You can rock out to Bumblefoot. Or you can read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, which is updated daily. Here we go. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show, where we get to the weird, the strange, the sometimes wacky and odd, and the odd time pretty cool. All right, let's start off with this. If you like coffee and you like to fly, well, this may be right up your alley. New Zealand's national airline says it is trialing edible coffee cups in a bid to reduce the amount of waste on board its planes. The cups, by local company Twice, are made from vanilla-flavored biscotti and are apparently leak-proof. Air New Zealand, which serves more than 8 million cups of coffee a year, said it wanted to reduce the amount of waste sent to landfills. But some said a change in cups was not a big enough environmental commitment. In a statement, Air New Zealand said the coffee cups were being tested in the air and on the ground as part of its efforts to find innovative ways to meet sustainability challenges. The cups have been a big hit with the customers who have used these, and we have also been using the cups as dessert bowls, Air New Zealand's Nikki Chavez says. Jamie Cashmore, the co-founder of Twice, says the cups could really have a positive impact on the environment. In the UK alone, some 2.5 billion coffee cups are estimated to be thrown away each year, and only 0.25% of them are ever recycled. Air New Zealand said the trial edible cups followed a recent switch to compostable cups made from paper and corn used in all of its aircraft and lounges. But some social media users, of course, they've got to have their say, said the airline needed to change more than coffee cups if it wants to help the environment. Flights produce greenhouse gases from burning fuel, which contribute to global warming when released into the atmosphere as they drive away in their SUVs. Yeah. Well, it's a step in the right direction. The customers love it. Go for it, Air New Zealand. All right. Who remembers the saying, here I come to save the day? Remember Mighty Mouse? Well, genetically edited Mighty Mice are being sent up to the International Space Station today as experts investigate how to limit muscle and bone loss in low gravity. Tweak to have an enhanced muscle growth. Yeah, in other words, why don't they just say they injected these mice with steroids? Okay, like they could kick our butts, these mice. 
The ripped rodents will ride on board a ship being launched by Elon Musk's SpaceX. The mission has been scheduled to launch, but rough winds, yesterday that is, but rough winds detected in the upper atmosphere forced a one-day delay for safety reasons. Liftoff just happened moments ago, a couple hours ago, from Kennedy Space Center. Its Dragon capsule will go on to dock with the space station on Sunday. The mice will get tested out. They're going to be lifting weights, pumping iron. They're going to pump themselves up. Hailing from the Jackson Laboratory in Maine, a nonprofit biomedical research facility, the mice have been genetically manipulated in order to enhance their muscle growth. The little spacefarers will help scientists study how to mitigate bone and muscle loss in low gravity, an issue in which humans presents an obstacle to long-distance missions further out into the solar system. According to the Jackson Laboratory website, the mice study will also be tremendously valuable in understanding muscle degeneration in humans here on Earth. Earth as well. The Mighty Mice are but the latest rodent visitors to the International Space Station and follow in the tiny footsteps of 20 mice, each genetically identical, who spent a few weeks in the orbiting laboratory earlier this year. These previous mice, who all returned to Earth safely, were seen to behave there essentially as they would here on Earth. Because they're mice. What else are they going to do? Fly a rocket? Oh. Anyway, sticking with space... Think your basement brewing project is tough? Well, apparently they're going to try and brew beer on the ISS. Also heading up very soon is a commercial resupply ship, 19, is a Budweiser-sponsored brewing project. Oh, we're going to get astronauts absolutely liquored now. I don't know if that's a good idea. I really don't. This is the fourth experiment that the massive brewery has sent into space. In 2017, Anheuser-Busch announced an initiative at the South by Southwest Conference to become the first brewery on Mars. To get this experiment off the ground, it partnered with the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space which helps facilitate science experiments on the ISS. In December of that year, the Macro Brewery sent the first two experiments to the ISS aboard CRS-13 to test germination and see how 20 barley seeds would withstand gravity. The third experiment, launched last November, tested how well the seeds would steep, germinate, and kiln, according to Food & Wine. The goal for this latest mission, the company wrote in its proposal, is to compare malt to controls produced on the ground to identify morphological and genetic alterations caused by microgravity. Here's how the experiment will work. The seeds are set to arrive at the ISS today with the mice. Let's hope the mice don't eat them. They're completely dry. Soon after they show up, they will be steeped in water for a period of time to increase their moisture content and then left to air dry and hopefully germinate. After the seeds begin to germinate, the astronauts will begin kilning the process where they apply heat to the germinated seeds in order to coax out their malty flavors. Eventually, the seeds will be stowed and shipped back to Earth, where scientists on the ground will examine the seeds and evaluate whether the germination process was successful in microgravity. They'll analyze the genetic profile of the seeds and compare them to the control seeds that were germinating the good old-fashioned way back here on Earth. I just hope that they send up some beers for these people up there. They need some beers. Come on, Budweiser. Come on, Anheuser-Busch. Let's get liquored on the ISS, shall we? Let's do it. Send the beer up with the seeds. They'll get it Sunday. An organism that can feed on meteorites from outer space could shed light on the emergence of life on Earth and how living creatures may survive on other planets. The organism known as Metallosphera... Sedula, because you always have to have the last name, Sedula, is a type of bacteria-like microbe that gets its energy from inorganic substances. Researchers have discovered that M. Sedula feeds on minerals contained in meteorites faster than it feeds on those in Earth-based rocks. That's why there's freedom needed up there. That's why we got to go up there for the freedom of the minerals. The findings prove valuable insight into the conditions that allow 
early life to emerge and evolve on Earth, as well as how microbes could survive in outer space. M. Sedula is known to cope well with heat at low pH levels, and previous experiments have shown it could survive in Martian soil. Researchers from the University of Vienna decided to test it out on a 120-kilogram meteorite known as NWA-1172, which was found in northwest Africa in 2000. The meteorite, which is rich in iron, which microbes os- oxidize, in order to respire, and other trace metals which facilitate metabolic activity and microbi- microbial growth. Yeah, for comparison, similar microbes were fed samples of an earth based mineral called chalco. What the hell is this? Chalcopyrite. There we go. Which is formed on copper, iron, and sulfur. Yeah, anyways, this is getting too, way too sciencey. These things eat meteorites, and who knows? Maybe we can shoot some rockets to some of these meteorites and asteroids out there have these things chomp it up you know go pac-man on these things can we say pac-man anymore is that still allowed i don't know as cell phones have gotten smarter they've also become marginally more dangerous to the clumsy easily distracted humans holding them according to new research no kidding Before phones came loaded with perilous pings from Twitter, read receipts, or news alerts, the researchers found they posed less risk to the integrity of the users' faces. Around 2007, the year the first iPhone was released, the number of head injuries caused by cell phones spiked. No kidding. Really? We need a scientific experiment for this thing? Come on! You see it every day. Just go to a major city. How many people walk off the sidewalk, walk into poles, fire hydrants, other people? It offenses doors. Haven't you seen that video of the lady who's on her phone and she's at a gym and she walks into the glass windows like three times, almost knocking herself out? It's beautiful. I love it when that happens. It's what life is all about. You know, it makes for great fail videos on YouTube that old Davey loves to watch. Anyways, this study, apparently, according to Boris Paskover, the phone went from being a phone to being a mobile platform. This is We're paying money to these scientists to tell us this. Let me repeat old Boris's theory. Yeah. I don't get it, but we're going to repeat it. He goes on to say, once again, the phone went from being a phone to being a mobile platform. This is the brilliant research of a head and neck surgeon at Rutgers University Medical Center in New Jersey. Yeah, old phones, according to old Boris, I wonder if he's Borai for plural didn't distract people so much that they tripped and cut their eyelids. They also didn't slip out of people's hands. Well, that's why you get one of them funky things on the back of your phone now. Saved my phone a lot. Anyways, he goes on to say, you know, they fall in their hands, they fall in their noses, they're breaking bones. People stop being aware of their surroundings. Once again, scientific money being shown and thrown at the obvious. Apparently, between 1998 and 2017, there have been 2,501 cases of cell phone-related injuries. Estimates is the equivalent of just over 76,000 injuries nationwide during that same period. Around 40% of the injuries were in uh, involving people between the ages of 13 and 29, And the most common diagnosis, heaven forbid, was a deep cut. Cell phone injuries fall into one of two categories, moronic and idiotic, as we move on here. Pay attention to your surroundings. It works better. Anyways, a bright fireball streaked across the night sky in the Midwest with sightings reported in Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Minnesota, Missouri, Ohio, and Wisconsin. The American Meteor Society said there were about 100 reports of a fireball in the sky around 6.15 on Tuesday night. Yeah, the suspected 
meteor was recorded by a doorbell camera in Chicago and a dashboard camera in Riverside, Illinois. It was unclear whether the fireball got low enough in the atmosphere to drop any fragments to Earth. And finally, sheriff deputies in Ohio are having a tough time. Why? Well, they're trying to wrangle a loose pig in a resident's yard, and the unusual chase was recorded by body cameras. Erie County Sheriff Paul Sigsworth says deputies responded to a report of a loose farm animal in a residential neighborhood, arriving to find a 200-pound pig on the loose. Old Porky wasn't having any of that. He didn't want to become bacon. So old Porky here, running around, and the police are chasing him, throwing a few donuts, and holy cow, we got a masterful video going. Once in a while, we get a call of a loose cow, but this is the first time I can remember getting a call about a large pig, Sigworth said. Body camera footage from the scene shows deputies chasing after the pig and attempting to entice it with apples. The sheriff's office said the pig was eventually wrangled into the barn. Deputies were able to locate the animal's owner, who says the pig's name is Wilbur. All right. Marty, we need a clown on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Thank you, Marty. Today's thought of the day is as follows. Really? They needed a... Imagine how much money was spent on that study about the moronic use of cell phones and cell phone injuries. Think about the money, people. Because it all costs money. These studies cost money and time. All right? Thousands upon thousands of dollars wasted to tell us the obvious. That people don't pay attention while on their cell phones. Ah, oh, you know what? One of these days for the thought of the Dave, or maybe not the thought of the Dave, maybe just for the news, I'm going to drag up some of the most stupid studies, or at least what I feel is stupid studies and waste some money for you guys to hear what these universities and research companies are spending, you know, government grants and taxpayer dollars on. It's ridiculous. I want to do that one day. Maybe we'll do that in the next Thought of the Dave or, or the Roundtable or something. Anyways, today's Thought of the Dave, what do you think is happening in missing 411 cases? Rob, bad luck, aliens, man, Bigfoot. It's on Twitter. Anthony, tattoo man. Yeah, he's in Connecticut, so if you need some ink, go see Anthony. Possibly falling through or passing through some type of rift into another dimension, being trapped there as well. Bruce, my thought is people are on the verge of being another missing, may benefit from listening to their feelings. The variety of causes of missing cases requires case-by-case study. I worked in strange forest encounters between 75 and 83, documented on page 75 of the book Bigfoot by State. Rebecca. I know, right? They need guinea pigs for everything. Wow. That's kind of large in charge. All right. Let's see what we got on our Facebook here. Let's see where we're going with that. Oh, that's the wrong one. Hold on. I got to bring this up. I closed the wrong window. That's my bad. Okay, here it is. Graham. Some may be natural portals. See, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. I think these people could be stepping into a different dimension. I don't even need tinfoil around my head to figure that one out. Tim, portals to a not-so-nice place, in my opinion. See, there's the portal thing again. There it is. Serena, likeliest explanation is that it is all multifactorial. Portals, cryptid encounters, UFO abduction. Yes, maybe all of the above. Bigger question is, are they all connected? Can there be UFO driving Bigfoots that are 
using portals to access the earth and take these people? Okay, that's my sarcasm, she goes on to say. Just a tiny bit. The missing 411 cases, Serena says, are so intriguing, incredibly well-researched, definitely worth further investigation. Dave, think you got the wrong number? No, I don't think so. Edie believes it's dogmen who are responsible. Nikki. She has about 18 Ks in between I's in her name. I don't know why. She says, Vortexes, possible alien issues, possible Sasquatch. And our favorite veteran around here, Marty, on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Since these disappearances occur in clusters in the same areas over and over, there must be portals that act as doorways between dimensions in these areas that people simply fall into and they can't get out of. But here's the, I want to add something to this, Marty. What if they don't know they've crossed into a different dimension or walked through a portal? And to them, everything is still the same. Think about that. That's where this gets whole oh, so, 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 so deep. I bet you Dave Politis is looking at that. Almost guarantee he will or is. Hey, I want to say a big thank you to everybody taking part in the Thought of the Dave on Twitter and on Facebook. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Big thank you to Captain Shirk for some fantastic news tonight. Fantastic news. Great job, Captain. You can find all their news on the SOR Newswire. CanAmMissing.com is David Politis' website where you can find his latest book, Missing 411 Canada. Highly suggest you get it. It is number nine in his series. Thank you to David Politis for coming on this show for the first time. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with everybody. With every what? What the hell is the song called? Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, in our chat rooms on LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the SOR Space Travelers on our website. Everybody in Spreaker, you pack the house there and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Our Keith Andrews, tomorrow night, finishing off week one of December. We're turning up the woo, not to 10, not to 20, not to 30, but to 100. Get your tinfoil out. See you tomorrow night. Good night.